bless you all. Bless you. Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That's what we're living in. Yeah. We're living in perilous times. Yeah, yeah. Everything's perilous. Mm -hmm. I go to do a job, it's perilous. You go to church, it's perilous. Perilous for men of God. Perilous for the saints. Iniquity abounds. Love of many waxes cold. Yeah, iniquity certainly is abounding. There's an onslaught of demonic activity. And we look at the, at the onset of mass media and technology and entertainment industry, and it has allowed the flourishing of every kind of evil spirit, every kind of lust, every kind of temptation. It's multiplied, it's magnified. Weeks before, we were talking about how this is seven times worse. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Seven times worse. So it's perilous times. Everything seems to be perilous. Like we're in jeopardy every hour. Every hour. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We talked through previous weeks many times of how the American way and the idea and the doctrine, the philosophy of democracy that everybody has a right is actually cultivating iniquity in everybody, right? So if you have a right, then you have power to do what you want. The democracy says to you, you have a right, therefore I can't tell you what to do because you have a right to do what you want to do. And what are you doing? You're destroying hierarchy. You're destroying the platform that God laid to set authority in order to op give the opportunity of submission and worship. So mm -hmm. democracy destroys hierarchy. Mm -hmm. if you say, yeah. Or anything that tries to advocate that everybody's equal then destroys the concept of hierarchy eventually. Well, if you destroy the, the concept of hierarchy, then you're, you're not subject to anybody. Yeah. You've got a right. So what's the result? Men become lovers of their own selves. They become occupied with themselves, concerned with themselves, seeking their own pleasure, seeking their own pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and all of that stuff. And what does that do? That cultivates the pursuits of pleasure and lust and every kind of ungodly thing. And it makes everything perilous because when you live for yourself and you love yourself, you don't have the capacity to have empathy, to have feelings about other people and what you're doing to them and how you might trespass against them and how you might be injurious to them. People don't have a conscience in this society. They don't have a thankful heart in this society or a conscience. The conscience of our generation is seared by democratic rights and other things. And that philosophy of thinking crept into the church. It makes everything perilous. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Incontinent means you can't, you have no rule over your spirit. You can't hold back. You ever want to talk about anger? Anger is a powerful spirit. It's a powerful emotion. It has a strength to it. It has a, a, a momentum to it. Anger it has a power to it. And if you don't have rule over your spirit, anger can rise up. And what happens when you're angry? What happens when you go into a rage? When you go into a rage... You, you, you lose your sense of judgment. Rage is blind. Rage will... You know, rage, rage is so intense and so blinding that when God raged against His people... Now, I'm not saying that God, doesn't, that God forgets things or that God isn't all-knowing. But if you go back to the story with God and Moses and God was angry at His people and He said... Separate yourself, I'll, I'll blot out all these people. God was in a rage. Moses had to remind God. He said, listen, you said you, brought, you would bring them out of the land of Egypt. And before the Egyptians, you, you can't wipe them out because God, you said this and you said that. And, God, and so God repented. Amen. But do you see, there's such a rage in God. It was such a powerful move, movement of a spirit. 
That's almost like God forgot, forgot what he said. So rage is blind. Ra rage is... There's a word I'm looking for. Rage doesn't... Rage is impulsive. Rage does not consider the consequences of what it's about to do. It flies off. Now, it's impossible to be a Christian today without de dealing with anger to a certain extent. So as we're talking, be angry and sin not. So you have to deal with anger. So anger is, you know, whosoever is angry at his brother without a cause. You can be angry at your brother with a righteous cause, but just don't sin. Mm -hmm. Don't rage. Mm -hmm. Don't do something impulsive that you will regret. And so... When we live in the perilous time, when men are lovers of them, their own selves, and iniquity waxes cold, and men go around with a, almost without conscience, even, even us, we, we're, uh, we're, we're just kind of a hardened, hardened generation, there is a lot of opportunity for the demonic realm and, and to move in and inspire all kinds of offenses and injury. Anyway, I might get back to that word injury, depending on where I go with this. So there are traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There's a form of godliness, but denying the power. Now I like to talk about denying the power in two different ways approaches two different applications you can deny the power of God to forgive you you can deny the power of the grace of God to be sufficient to bring you through circumstances or failures so you don't want it but then you can also deny the power of God that God can work in you to produce the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your mortal body and fulfill everything that was written in the law. And fulfill it not by a self-willed effort, but to fulfill it by, uh, by, by nature, motivated by a love for God, recognizing that God is holy, and so we are holy. And holiness is more than just because God said you're holy. Holiness is more than the rhetoric of God. Oh, I'm holy because God said I'm holy and it doesn't matter what I do. And that is not holiness. You perfect it. You perfect the holiness until you produce the same holy, divine, righteous nature in Jesus Christ in your mortal body. And if you deny that, you are denying the power of God to live righteously, soberly, godly, in this present world. And that is a mark to hold up. Yeah, you'll fail, you'll fall, you should, you'll fall short, you'll do all of that. But don't tear down that mark. Mm -hmm. Don't tear down that mark. Don't say God doesn't care what happens in your body when the body, when the Bible says very clearly, the body is for the Lord. The body is to is to manifest, demonstrate the image and character and purity and holiness of Jesus Christ demonstrated by your actions and deeds as you yield your members to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And if your flesh is doing something else, then who are you yielding your members to? Mm -hmm. And when you come to the judgment and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what are we going to stand there and what are we going to receive for? We're going to receive for the things that were done in our body. We're not going to be received because of how we thought in believing or thought in unbelieving. But we're going to be judged and we're going to receive according to whatever took place in our bodies. This is a perilous time. The contortions and distortions and perversions of the scriptures... And we talked about how uh, perversion is everywhere. It's in society. It's in authority. It's in us as subordinates. 
It's just a perverted society. It's everywhere. So you have a situation. You might have authorities and you might have subordinates. And the, and the authorities are charging the subordinates with rebellion. And the subordinates are looking up and they're looking at the authorities and they're saying, well, the authorities have become perverse. And you can go like that on forever, back and forth. Right? Yeah. Well, you, it's a perilous thing. God is going to have to do something here. Because perversion and authority will minister and justify rebellion. Yeah. Right? And rebellion in the people will, will provoke the authorities and, become, and make them disenchanted. They might even get discouraged to the point where they need comforting and then they fall to the false comforts of this world. We were t talking last week. Pastor Mike Hoggard, that Baptist pastor, for two hours going down the line, pastor after pastor after pastor after man of God after man of God, wrapped up in the pursuit of sexual comforts. And this is, a, this is a widespread thing among many, many, many men of God. Yeah. David Wilkerson talked about it. Other people have talked about it. It's not an isolated thing. For of this sort, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Okay, if you want to say, don't deny the power of God to forgive your brother, and don't deny the power of God that the power of God's grace can keep him when he falls into sin. But my, my whole issue there has always been that there are some people that for them, the grace of God will only work after the fact. It'll only work after they sin. Why can't the grace of God work before the fact? It can work before the fact. I'm telling you it can. Yeah. Don't deny that the power of God can keep you from committing sin in the first place. In such a way that it is not your own righteousness. Because the grace of God can do that. Don't deny that power either. All right. Ever learning. Oh no, I'm ahead of myself. Yeah, so the perilous times. For this sort, are they? Well, who are these people? They're, for this sort, are they which creep into houses and lead captive... Silly women laden with sins left away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. There's a lot of things I'd like to say here. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. So the folly of all these men will be made manifest. Last week I spoke from a scripture out of Isaiah, how Isaiah said, I gave Egypt for your ransom. And we expounded it and described how God lets unsaved heathen men and women fail and falter, and he lets them do it in such a high profile way that the media picks up on it, and you can see it, and God is saying, you see, I'm giving Egypt for your ransom. I'm letting these people be destroyed by various kinds of unclean spirits so that you can watch their destruction, so that they can be crucified unto you, so it can instruct you what not to do. And they are going to be destroyed in this destruction. But it's being destroyed so you can watch it. So you can receive instruction. So you don't have to fulfill and... Uh, how do they say it all the time? We're not locked in. We're not locked in to go all the way and fulfill, fulfill these evil things to their utter destruction. And so you saw a while back, you had all of a sudden you had all these higher profile men of position and power, movie moguls, and, and you've had all the Catholic priests, and you've had other people, Harvey Weinstein and... Bill Cosby, all men of position and power and seeing what happened when they sowed all their sexual perversion and coercion. And it's not just a, a passing by. This, these issues are not just a passing by. These guys wanted to have sex with women. No, these were guys who were, who were 
drugging the women. These are people who were working a, an iniquitous manipulation constantly over and over again and defiling many women. So God, so God r- raises up the awareness and puts all that stuff on large display. All of a sudden, do you see how all of a sudden it started happening? Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, Catholic priests, and, and then even before that, you had Jimmy Swaggart and Jimmy Baker. Um, and so, God gave that, that for our ransom. So God is first showing our generation all of that stuff as an instruction. Of this sort of they which creep in houses, lead captive silly women, laid in the sins of the divers' lust. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Now the significance of that is that this scripture is identifying truth itself as an authority, as an ultimate. As Jannies and Jambres resisted the truth. You don't want to resist the truth. Okay, and it's saying that it's, it's not particularly identifying it with a particular individual. No, as these, as Jannies and Jambres withstood, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Okay, they're, they're, they shall proceed no further, the folly shall be made manifest. And that's what you're seeing. Harvey Weinstein. Bill Cosby, Jim Swagger, Jim Baker, on and on down the road. You had a guy named Eddie Long. Eddie Long, he, has a, he had a great big mega church. And he was rocked with a scandal because he was um, mentoring young men and he was a homosexual. And he would lure the boys into homosexual affairs. And when it finally came abroad, when the folly was finally made manifest... I saw the man myself stand in a pulpit and almost in defiance, claiming himself righteous, trying to, trying to compare his sexual scenario and his, his, his abuse of his authority and power, trying to demonstrate and characterize it like he's in a great battle and he's David and they're Goliaths. And he asserted himself, almost defiant, and if you want to follow on what happened to the man, he got some strange sickness, who knows, maybe AIDS, I don't know, cancer, some sort of thing. And in a few months' time, he shriveled up into a, a gaunt, prune-like, little skinny old man when he used to have the strapping muscles and everything else, and he died. God took him out. So... Do we receive instruction like that, or, or do we not? Paul says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And again, we want to be careful we don't characterize our scourge and God dealing with our scourge, our sins, our iniquities, our misuse of the anointing, our misuse of authority and everything else, or our misuse or our rebellion or anything else, and the consequences that come as a result of it. We don't want to sit there and characterize that like the sufferings of Christ. Okay? Now, if somebody left Eddie Long's church... I said, why do you leave Eddie Long's church? I said, well, because the man was found to be a homosexual and he was, um, he was doing a very evil work, of a, a predatory sexual work of luring young men into homosexuality and I have a young boy and I didn't, so, so I left the church. Now, can Eddie Long say, stand up and say, I'm suffering for righteousness sake? No. no. Can Eddie Long say, if someone asks, how come those people are leaving your church? Can any long stand up and say, well, how come they left Jesus? How come they left Paul? Yeah. No, they can't. Okay. You, because you're, you, 
There's a difference between suffering for righteousness' sake and suffering because of our evil. All, of, all, this, all, all, we're saying it all along, and I don't want to just nitpick on authority, but there is an issue with everything in the church that's perilous, not just rebellion of the subordinates or the saints, but that is a problem. That always has been a problem. God's people have always been stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious. We've always been like that. And that's a proper indictment against us. But there's something going on in authority today also, which is ministering to that condition. Right? So, so will this ever stop? Where the authority says, ah, you're rebellious, and the rebellion says, yeah, but you're perverse, yeah, but that's, you're rebellious and you're provoking and... Well, we can blame each other all day long. Yet there's a certain um, things that are the acknowledging of the truth that people need to do. And, and in the issues of peacemaking and in the issues of reconciliation, in order for there to be reconciliation, in order for there to be peace between you and God or what have you, Okay? When God decided He wanted to make peace with man, who had to make the first move? Did man have to make the first? Well, you might argue that man has to draw nigh to God, that God draws nigh to man, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that God so loved the world. And when you talk about charity... When you talk about charity and showing charity for the purpose of reconciliation, always, 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 the onus is on the greater vessel to initiate the first act of charity. Always, 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 always. The greater vessel, the onus, the responsibility, the necessity is upon the greater vessel to first demonstrate an act in charity. God didn't have to redeem anybody from this world. He could have wiped it out and sent it to hell. But God came down. Now, let me talk about peacemakers because blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. If you are a child of God, you are a son. And if you're a woman, like we could say you're a daughter. But basically, the church all encompassed men and women and whoever is in the church we're equal to a manifestation of the Son. Okay? And then the Son can do nothing except what He sees the Father do. So what did the Father do? When the Father wanted to make peace, and He wanted to make reconciliation, He so loved the world, charity out of the heart of God, God's charity, He made the first move, and He sent Jesus Christ. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When Joseph was yet espoused to Mary, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, and so on and so forth and so forth. And then Jesus was born in a manger. And there appeared a multitude from heaven. Angels. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. So what was God's overture of peace that came out of his heart of love that he had to instigate first before men could be made have what peace with God. It was Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came, that was God saying, peace. It's God saying, I'm trying to be a peacemaker. And what is the thing about Jesus Christ? Why, Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh. But it was a different manifestation of God as compared to the Father in all His glory, as opposed to the Almighty God filling heaven and earth and all of that. So what did God do when He came and sent Jesus and dwelt in Him? Well, here's what's going on. God wanted to make peace. So God could not, be, God could not make peace by holding His status as the Almighty God. If God wanted to sit on the throne and hold and maintain His status as Almighty God, no one would ever be saved because everybody would fall short of His glory and there's no way to access God because sin has separated man from God. So God could hold His status and say, I am God. Mm -hmm. yeah. and nobody would be saved. 
So what did God have to do? He had to drop his status. He had to drop his status. So I'm going to drop the almighty, all-powerful God status. And I'm going to reduce myself to the same thing you are. I'm going to become equal to you. Or similar. Equal may not be the best word here. But you see what I'm saying? God came down. He became a man. Because he... Out of a heart of charity, he wanted to make peace. And if he wants to make peace out of necessity, he has to drop his status and meet men as men. So he became a man. Blessed are the peacemakers. So we're sons of God. Okay? We have various members of the body of Christ with various callings, various anointings, various levels of authority. Well, when you're a peacemaker, once you start making peace, if you want to make peace, especially peace between two people who are at odds at, at, odds at one another, somewhere you've got to drop your status. Okay? So if you're, if you're a great man of God and you're, you're a great apostle and you want to make peace with someone down there, one of the lower saints... Well, what do you have to do? You have to drop your status. You have to stop. You have to drop your apostles. I'm not, I don't mean permanently. I don't mean ultimately. And, and when I say that, when you're dropping your status, what you're doing is you're condescending to the lower estate, to the man of lower estate. If the greater is not willing for a season to just cast off his high status or his high calling in order to make reconciliation, then how can there be peace? That's what God had to do. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, once you make peace and you get established in everything else, now, don't get me wrong, God, dwelling in Jesus Christ, God never let man take dominion over him. Right. He never did that. And if I drop my status to make peace and you try to capitalize and take advantage of it, well then, the deal for peace is off. It's the same with God. If you want to try to take advantage of the fact that God came down, humbled himself, and became a man, and you think you can manipulate God or anything like that, well then, forget it. The peace covenant is off. God's not going to let you do that. But there's something about peacemaking and dropping the status and try, as, where you, you stop trying to hold superiority over people and requiring things of them because of your superiority, right. that if you really want to make peace, you have to drop your status like God did. Blessed are the peacemakers. Is Jesus Christ the high priest? He certainly is. He is now the high priest over the house of God. What are the characteristics of a high priest? Why, he's holy. He is harmless. Harmless. We're living in a perilous time. Many transgressions. Many perversions. Many things injurious. You don't think men of authority are injurious to the people of God sometimes? How about Paul? Well, let's go there for a while. Let's go there. Um, the Lord says, Who is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? Well, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. Paul was a steward over the mysteries of God. And for that matter, if you wanted to extend it down, the church is also a steward of the mysteries of God. But Paul, what was Paul like before he actually was converted? Well, where should I go with this? He raised hell. Um, yeah, he was a hell raiser for sure. Um, I don't know whether I should go to the Luke 16 yet or not. But anyway, okay, Luke 16 is the parable of the unjust steward. I'm going to start there. I guess I am going to go there. I didn't think I was, but I guess I will. And he said to his disciples, there's a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And we know the scriptures are spiritually discerned. This is a spiritual story. 
It's a story for the people of God. The scriptures aren't for the world. The scriptures are for the people of God. The rich man is Jesus. The steward is the minister of God. And then, by extension, down to the body of Christ who can also function in ministerial, minister to one another. But chiefly, it's talking about a steward. Let a man so account of us, Paul said, as stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it's required that uh, in stewards that a man be found faithful. So the certain rich man has a steward. The steward was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Well, what, is, what are the Lord's goods? The Lord's goods are his people. That's the Lord's goods. That's his church. That's his people. And the steward was accused that he wasted the Lord's goods. Now, and hang on to that. Galatians 1, 11, 13, to, through the 13, 14, maybe to 24, we'll see how far we go. I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I neither received of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the, persecuted the church of God and wasted it. This man is accused that he has wasted his Lord's goods. I persecuted the church of God, I wasted it. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. Now let's stop a minute. The Apostle Paul is a very profound and illustrated and magnified example of authority, and he was the chief authority, he was apostle above the apostles, and he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he had an extremely high profile, not only in the early church, but also in the scriptures. So that all, most of these epistles are written by the Apostle Paul. So he is a pattern to be watched. Yeah, Paul, God said, God showed him me first a pattern of long-suffering. Paul did an awful lot of evil things, and God was still long-suffering. Men of God out there can do an awful lot of evil things, and God can still be long-suffering with them. But by and large, Paul is an example. If you look at Paul before his conversion... And you look at Paul after his conversion. So that means any one of us, or a man of God, or a man of authority, before his heart has actually been converted, his zeal can be misapplied in his body to fulfill the works of Paul. And in any area where your heart's not converted, you have this religious zeal, but instead, what you end up doing is persecuting the church. Wasting the church. And he says in another place that I was injurious. I did injury to the body of Christ. What I'm saying is uh, that when you're, this, this is Paul the Apostle, either Saul of Tarsus or Paul the Apostle. One is before conversion. The second is after conversion. And I'm saying conversion here is not a point in time in your life. Conversion here depends on the state of your heart in certain areas of your heart. There can be areas of your heart where you have not yet been converted. Then you could be subject to operate this way. All right, so we talked about King Manasseh. King Manasseh was a king in Israel. For 55 years, for most of those 55 years, he shed innocent blood from one end to another, perverted judgment, took bribes, screwed around, screwed up, did all kinds of things. God didn't do a darn thing to him for 50-something years. Right? Psalm 50 says, you're partaker of a thief, you consented with adulterers, you slandered your own brothers and sisters, and these things thou hast done, and I kept silence. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't judge you. I just kept silence. How about King Manasseh? Did that stuff for 50 years. God didn't do anything. Just kept silence. Right? I wonder if the man waxed more and more confident that he wasn't doing anything wrong because nothing was happening to him. Because sentence against a speedy, uh, uh, evil work is not speedily executed. But no, God didn't pass it by. God took the man at the end of his life and poured all kinds of judgment and affliction upon him. Just totally blew him away and drowned him out. Overwhelmed him with all kinds of catastrophic affliction and 
judgments and consequences. And what did King Manasseh do? Why he humbled himself. When he was in affliction, he humbled himself. All right. So, I mean, the story has a good ending, right? He died in peace with his fathers. But you see... But if we're going to make peace, we have to drop our status. Okay? If, if me and anybody here, if I'm at odds with anybody here, and I'm going to make peace, I, I, I'm not going to be able to pull rank on you and say, well, I'm a teacher, and therefore you have to do thus, 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 and so. No, I'm going to have to drop my rank. I'm going to have to meet you as an equal during the restoration reconciliation process. We're going to have to be equals. We're going to mediate. We're going to work it out. We're going to restore fellowship, be reconciled, and then afterwards we can resume, resume our status. You think God, after coming down and making, trying to make peace with man through Jesus Christ, you don't think eventually God's going to take all his authority back and be the most high? He is. He's going to, be, he's going to take it all back, right? Jesus is going to, uh, after the thousand years, Jesus is going to take everything that's under him and he's going to deliver it right back up to the Father so God can be all in all and God's going to finally resume his high status that he started out with in the first place. But if, but if somewhere in there he doesn't come down and drop his status as Almighty God, no, God's too high and we're too low. If God is not willing to drop his status, we're not being reconciled to God. And there are certain situations in the church right now Certain men, certain men of authority, just so they'll drop their status and come down to equal and lower their bar a little bit, then there is not going to be any reconciliation. And it's not my standard I'm promoting. This is the law of God. This is the law of how we make peace. According to the pattern of the scripture, it's the law of God. I'm not speaking my own words. Well, Uh, so we're talking about the unjust steward was accused that he had wasted his father's goods. And so I read the scripture in Galatians where Paul saying, look, I was very zealous, but I really didn't know anything about God. But I was really zealous. I persecuted the church of God. I wasted it. King Manasseh, as the king of Israel, spent 50 years wasting the people of God, hardly acknowledging it, not realizing it, probably thought he was always right, probably thought everything was going his way because God never, God kept silence, never dealt with it. Well, his pride. Yeah. And also the long-suffering of God, right? Mm -hmm. God's just being long-suffering. And then there's the issue of pride. And that's, and we, but we all have that. Remember, we, I, we preached on it the other week right. that when the mind is hardened in pride, then you cannot accept or admit fault, and you cannot adopt or receive or put on godly humbleness and humility. A, a mind hardened in pride is the state of a person being utterly unclean, because the plague of leprosy is in his head. And we're granted repentance according to the acknowledging of the truth. You simply cannot snap your fingers and become a new creature by snapping your own fingers. You have to go through an operation of God. Therefore, repentance is based on the spirit of your mind acknowledging the truth as a starting point. So if, you, if your mind is hardened in pride, you won't even get past the starting point. Okay, and people today are also advocating the confession of sin as the only requirement to God as the remedy for your sins. Well, if you sin, all you have to do is confess. All you have to do is confess. That's what the Catholics do. Mm -hmm. That's what the Catholics do. No, you, you have to uh, con confess. He that confesses and forsaketh. As we heard in the past, yeah. forsaking is not forsaking the penalty. It's not forsaking the feeling of guilt and condemnation. It is forsaking the committing of that sin. You turn from it. You begin to turn from it. Now, people advocate that uh, confession is all you have to do. So they're, they're, they're looking at confession like it's the finishing line. Okay, I've sinned and I confess. It's done. It's the finishing line. Well, and I'm not against confession. But, and neither is the Bible. Neither is Jesus. Neither is you or I or any, anybody who's a Christian with half a sense of spirituality. But 
Confession is the starting blocks. The acknowledging of the truth is the starting block. And that's all done in the spirit of your mind. So if your mind's hardened, like I say, you have put a, a roadblock at the very beginning works of repentance. So if you can't acknowledge the truth, how are you going any further? You're utter, utterly unclean. Well, that's a, an offside. Uh, it's something that we've said a couple of times over the weeks and months. But anyway, so Paul, he was persecuting the church of God and wasting it. Let's get back to that. And in Acts chapter 26, Paul talking to King Agrippa. And Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jew. He goes on and he gives a testimony of his life. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I was the Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God, day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jew. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue. And I compelled them to blaspheme. Well, that's like spiritual bullying. You ever see a mild-mannered kid and the, the bully comes and taunts him and can push him and shove him in his shoulder and try to trip him up as he walks? And then the young mild-mannered man was so provoked that the mild-mannered man does something he's just not accustomed to do. He turns around and slaps the bully in the face. And he's not even, that's not even in his nature. Yeah, right. He was compelled. He was provoked. He was pushed. I've spoke many times and we've visited the issue many times. If you want to visit the people of God with stripes, if you're a man of authority, you want to visit the people of God with stripes, then beat your, beat your brother with 40 stripes and then stop. No more than 40 stripes lest your brother seem vile unto thee. If you keep going on and hundreds and hundreds of stripes, what you're doing is you are, through the repetition of your own delivery of those stripes and rebukes and everything else and those berating, belittling comments, you keep doing it over and over again, you're cultivating your own mind so that it will lose its ability to think of anything about your brother except they're vile. Don't beat him about 40 strikes, lest your brother seem vile unto thee. You're cultivating your own mindset, and you will lose the ability to think of your brother as anything but vile. They'll be totally incapable. They'll be utterly stupid. They'll be just a bunch of nerd brains. And that's all all you'll ever be. See, we're talking about, we're not talking, we're not finding fault with the exercise. Men of God, reprove and rebuke. But as soon as you get superfluous, as soon as you get excessive, as soon as you use the platform of the calling and authority God gave you as a platform to vent off your own sore, then you're misusing. You're no longer accomplishing the will of God. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So one, you're cultivating yourself so that you'll lose the ability to think anything but evil of your brother, and two, the excessive amount of stripes will dumb down your congregation. And they'll be even less likely to receive what you're saying. Instructing those that oppose themselves. Yeah, so Paul said, uh, many of the saints have shut up in prison. I had received authority from the chief priests. Well, let's spiritualize it. I'm a teacher. As other men of God, where's my authority come from? Where's my authority come from? Where'd my anointing come from? Where's the anointing come from? What? Well, I can preach the principles of God, not like the scribes and the Pharisees, but as one having authority. Where does it come from? It comes from Jesus, the chief priest. You see? So, this is what I'm saying. Men of God do have authority from Jesus Christ. They do have anointings. They do have gifts. They do have callings. 
But the spirit of the prophets, what, are subject to what God says they'll do? No, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So the prophet, the, the, the gifts and calling are subject to the way the prophet uses it. And how the prophet uses it. And how the teacher uses it. And when the teacher uses it. I can be off in my judgments and I can use my gift and calling in a context and a method and a manner that is not fulfilling the perfect will of God. Because, because I am doing it according to what I understand and know at the time. I'm doing it according to what I've attained so far. And I have not attained to all things and all knowledge and all mysteries and all perfect understanding of the will of God. Did you know that the gifts and calling can operate outside of the will of God? Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, have we not taught in thy name? Have thou not taught in our streets? Did we not cast out devils? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. It was my anointing. It was my calling. It was the Holy Ghost. It was the power of God. But you weren't doing it in the context and in the will that I sent it for. You did it in your iniquity. You did it to promote yourself. What was the charge against Moses when he struck the rock the second time? And God was so angry, he said, you can't enter into the promised land. Moses, now granted, let's give the Moses a break here. The people of God were really evil. They really provoked him. So there was a real degree of provocation. But the issue was, Moses struck the rock and says, must we fetch water from the rock. And then what was God's charge? Moses, you didn't sanctify me before the people. You sanctified yourself. Must we, me and Aaron, me and Aaron, the minister and the anointing, must we fetch water? See, the man of God is supposed to, who's the, who's the man of God supposed to sanctify? Who's the minister supposed to sanctify? You won't see me calling my name that much. Because what we have to sanctify and lift up is Jesus Christ. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're your Lord. servants. Mm -hmm. And again, without accusing anybody of, of idolatry, and I'm sure lots of people or lots of ministers aren't trying to be idols, but if they talk of themselves and magnify their own, own offices in excess at the expense of magnifying Jesus, then they're in the same error as Moses. You're sanctifying yourself more than Jesus. Now, I'm sure these men also, they do sanctify Jesus. All right? And the way I put it before was, uh, you know, preachers like, to, like the amen corners. Preachers like to be received. Pre preachers like to be inspired by people saying, amen, preach it, brother. What a preacher, all that stuff. And that's that's fine and dandy, and I don't mind saying what a preacher. But mm -hmm. it's like if you say fifty what a preachers for every what a savior, you have one what a savior, and you have fifty what a preachers. And again, if your exercise of magnifying your office is excessive and superfluous, then you are cultivating the minds and spirits of the people to sanctify you more than Jesus. Now, is it wrong to try to get the people of God to sanctify you as a man of God? No, nothing wrong with that. I'm not arguing the principle. I'm arguing the excess and the superfluity, and I'm trying to describe the cause and the effect of that excess without accusing anybody of, tr of being an idolater. You don't have to want to be an idolater. It's simply a natural cause and effect. Man of God talks more about himself than Jesus, then he, Jesus won't be sanctified as much in the minds and hearts of the people. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Then right. God's going to come somewhere in your life and say, look, you're sanctifying yourself more than me. So there's a balance there. There's a balance there. All right. So Paul is before King Agrippa. He said, I barely thought myself I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which things I did in Jerusalem, many of the saints, I shut up in prison. Authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Punished them often in every synagogue. Compelled them to blaspheme. 
and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So the spirit of the Apostle Paul, before fully being converted, had such a zeal and such ignorance and blindness that he actually compelled people to blasphemy and he took the people of God and he persecuted them until they had to go off into strange cities. What's a strange city? We said this before. What's a strange city? Well, a strange city for us is that we were part of a fellowship of people who, were, who began to be truly sanctified, truly had come out of the denominational Christianity, who has obeyed the command of revelation, come out of her, my people, and we were functioning as a body of Christ, and then uh, sex or scandal or uh, all perversion enters in, and division and strife and, and uh, injury and, and all kinds of stuff happening from authority, and then we're persecuted and we come out, and now where are we? We're not really a part of the church world. We're not really in full fellowship with our brethren over there. We're, we're not part of the world. We're not fully reconciled to the church because we've been persecuted out. We're standing here in this strange city. This is strange. Is this not a strange city? Just a, a handful of people where we're like the uh, book of Acts where in the storm of Eurocladon, People were saved by hanging on to broken pieces of the ship. Well, we're still in the fellowship. We're still in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. We're still in the communion of the saints. We're still in the communion of the Holy Ghost. But we're grabbing on to a part of the ship that has been broken off by persecution. From people who are partly operating in a spirit of Saul of Tarsus. All right, I stand. Okay. I gave my cup, compelled them to blasphemy. I persecuted them to strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for thee to kick against the bricks? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Of course, we know, through all of that exercise of Paul, well, everything he did to the church, through it all, Jesus appears to him. He's converted. Right? He's converted. And afterwards, he does more to minister and show godly charity to the church than any other apostle after his conversion. Yeah. But before conversion, and listen, like I say, I'm not talking about conversion like, you know, a man of God got born again when he was 20 years old or 25 years old. And from then on, he, all he ever does is walk in the pure uh, works of the spirit of the Apostle Paul. It doesn't work like that. There's different areas of your heart where you are converted. There's different areas of your heart where you are not converted. And the whole example of Paul is showing you if you're operating in the old nature in an area you have not been converted yet and yet you are a person of God or a man of God you, you might have the characteristic of zeal like Paul did but, but you are still subject to that old way of operating. So I'm saying these old ways of Paul can be manifested anytime in, in any man of God whenever they revert back to following the old man. Whenever they fall back into pursuing their own pleasures and their own lusts, now they are cultivating the strengths of the old man. And the more they cultivate the strength of the, of the old man, the more their ministry is going to take the form of Saul before he was converted. Mm. Thinking you're reproving and rebuking the people and you're being injurious. Yeah. Compelling to blaspheme. And feeling good about it because you're zealous and I've got authority from the priest. I've got the authority from Jesus. Yeah, and you do. Satan has authority from Jesus, the anointed cherub, authority from God to worship, the anointed cherub that covereth. And to this day, Satan still is anointed. He still has a power and a function and an anointing and a moving 
of power that he got from God, but he's not using it for God's will. He's using it for his own will. Let's go right back to what we said. Oh, we cast out devils in your name, so on, so forth, so forth. You're working iniquity. I never knew you. Well, that's because the spirits are subject to the prophets. However the prophet uses it. However the prophet perceives he wants to use the gift. Whenever the prophet perceives he wants to use it. Not just the prophet. I say the prophet because Paul said, mm -hmm. said that in the scriptures. Spirit, any man of God. Any saint of God. Right. Alright, so. Back to the parable of the um, unjust steward. And I'm going to say this again. Go back to what I started talking about, peacemakers. Remember, the main point of being a peacemaker is that a peacemaker begins to make peace because the peacemaker has charity. It starts with charity. Remember? And I said, when any work of charity or reconciliation or peacemaking is instigated, the onus is always on the greater vessel to instigate the motion of charity first. We as sinful men were not capable of the charity of God. God had to first send His Son, Jesus Christ. He had to make the first move yeah. to make reconciliation. And it's the same pattern. You're in authority, you want reconciliation, it's your move. God dropped His God status to try to make peace because He really wanted some friends. Maybe people today don't want friends. Alright? Maybe they'd rather keep their pleasures than keep their brother. I don't know. But I'm just telling you, this is how reconciliation works. This is how it has to work. This is the necessity. This is the pattern. This is the scripture. This is the law of God. This is the law of charity. This is the law of Christ. So you have to drop your status. You have to lower your bar. We can go on with this. A certain man had a steward. The same was accused that he had wasted his goods. So we just we, we all we just went through all of that. Paul wasted the church. The goods were God's people. And he says, How is it that I hear of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, thou mayest no longer be steward. Well, here's this unjust steward. He has a gift and a calling. He's a steward over the people of God. And now he's being accused that he's wasting he's wasting it. He's seeking pleasure from it. He's eating and drinking with the drunk, drunken in his pursuits of lust, sex, drugs, whatever. And uh, as the Bible says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Who is that five, wise and faithful steward? Mm -hmm. But, and if that evil servant shall say within his heart, Jesus isn't coming yet. Onward with my pleasure agenda. And begins to eat and drink with the drunken. And begins to beat the men servants. Mm -hmm. Right? Excessive amount of stripes, like I said. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you right now, it just, it just goes without saying. When anybody is in excessive pursuit of pleasure, it's because their own heart is sore. It's seeking after comfort. Their own hearts have been aggravated. And what's the word I'm looking for? All right. And so that will also come out in their preaching. That's what I'm saying. It'll also come out in their preaching. So the steward says, what am I going to do? The Lord takes away from me the stewardship. So obviously this man had a threat of, am I going to finish my calling? I don't know if anybody's been there. I've been there a few times. Probably not to the depth of other men of God, but I've certainly gone through seasons. Is, is that it? Am I done? Am I finished? Is God taken away from me? I'll never teach again, that sort of thing. So he says, I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. You see? So it's signifying that the unjust steward... The man who has authority over God's goods. He can't dig. There's no time to dig. The ministry is in full swing. He can't dig. To beg, I am ashamed. I've sat in this position. I'm so used to receiving honor and authority that comes with my calling in my, my office. It's, it's, I can't, I can't, I'm ashamed to beg. What am I going to do? He says, I'm resolved to what to do. When I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses so he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou, my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto them, Take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. 
So what, what, what is it with this unjust steward? What did he do? What did he do to try to make peace again and reconciliation and fix the situation? What did he do? He said, well, how much do you owe the Lord? A hundred measures of oil. Well, oil is a type of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I want you to be this spiritual. Mm, I want you to see every darn word I say all the time. Mm -hmm. I want you to be spiritual. Well, what did the steward do when he was found wasting God's goods and everything else? He lowered the bar. He lowered the bar. He dropped his status. He says, oh, I said you owe all this. Sit down and write 50. Lowered the bar. Oh, I said you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G in order for me to, in order for you guys to qualify, to, to convince me that you've repented? No. Lower the bar. Lower your bar. Unless you don't want reconciliation. Unless you don't want us as friends. Unless, unless you're content in your perverted, pleasurable status quo. If that's what you want, then don't do anything. I'm just saying, here's the scripture. You've got to lower the bar to make peace. God lowered the bar. I'm Almighty God. Well, no, you couldn't be reconciled to God like that. He had to become a man. He had to come down to your level. He had to drop his Almighty God status right down to just, I'm a man like you. In other words, there's certain things that are required, even from men of authority, where in order to start reconciliation, the onus is on the authority. Always. Always. That's why we were upset, or that's why we couldn't, I won't say upset, but that's why we could not accept men of God laying charges of rebellion against women who wouldn't hug them. Because the law of charity says that if your brother or sister is offended in anything like that, then you as the authority, you as the man of of stature and charity, okay, then then you you just say, if it offends them, then I won't hug them while all the world stands. If it offends them. Not to lay charge against them and put it on them and say, why you women don't have charity or you'd want to hug me, hugging a man of God or not hugging a man of God, has nothing to do with the criteria for salvation. So, don't put the onus on the lesser vessel to respond charitably towards you. The onus is on you to be charitable toward the weaker vessel. Always, 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 without exception. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you are violating, transgressing what? Uh, Some kind of physical sin? No, you're transgressing the law of God. When you so transgress and wound the heart of your brethren, you sin against Christ. Just like Saul, injurious to the church. So men who do that, don't let them, don't, they can't stand up and say, I have wronged no man. Because it's a false witness. It's a false witness. See, then something has to happen then. There's got to be some humility. Somewhere, you'd have to drop the status and say, look, uh, even though I'm a great apostle and you're just a hokey old comely, don't know anything, doughhead saint, and we're at odds, uh, I'll tell you what, let's get down to the same level. We're all just sinners or whatever. You see what I'm saying? But if you want to hold this high bar and I'm the authority and you have to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, look, a lot of people, we were talking earlier about be angry and sin not. Mm-hmm. Whosoever is angry is his brother without a cause. Some of us have been angry without a cause, but sometimes we've been angry with a cause. Mm-hmm. It's like we said, as Jannies and Janbrez withstood Moses, so did these men resist the truth. There is a time when truth itself becomes the authority. You see the violent perversion, perverting of judgment and justice in a province? You see the violent perverting of judgment? You know, even Samuel's sons, they said, well, Samuel's sons aren't like you, Samuel. You know, they take bribes and they pervert judgment. Uh, make us a king to reign over us. Well, and the thing displeased Samuel when they said, make us a king, when the Lord your God was your king. 
It didn't displease Samuel when they said, hey, your sons are perverted and they're taking bribes and they're perverting judgment. That was a legitimate plea. Samuel didn't say anything about that. Just don't let perversions that you see all out and around you, the Bible says, marvel not at the matter. Don't get too bent out of shape over it. Don't let it bring you to the point where you don't want God's rulership. Make us a king. That's what upset Samuel. And that's what upset God. But to make the plea about Samuel's sons in and of itself, that wasn't addressed as wrong. That wasn't wrong. So, like I say, we've been up and down this issue, but sometimes there are issues of, of the truth. In times of perversion, perverted counsel, perverted doctrine, things where uh, you're instructed to partake in illicit activities, things submit to things that are perverted or sexual or otherwise, contrary to the scriptures, when you know uh, that's contrary to the scriptures, well then, truth is your bar then, in that case, for that particular point in time, for that particular situation, the truth. And that's why I pointed out in Timothy, they resisted, as they resisted Moses, so do they resist the truth. The truth was not identified with particular individual in that scripture, although they could have said it was with Moses, but truth is truth. All right, now, so how much you owe? A hundred me- uh, measures of oil. Take thy bell, sit down quickly, and write 50. All right, so I want you to be spiritual all the time and remember everything I said. And every- I'll tell you what, just instead of that, let's lower the bar a bit because I want to make peace, and I won't hold you to such a high bar anymore. And I'll tell you what, just listen best you can and try to get something out of it and let the Holy Spirit... And pay attention. Right? That would be lowering the bar. Mm-hmm. Well, what I'm saying is the parable of the unjust steward. The steward is walking in the threat of having his ministry taken away. I don't think that's any time to be proud and exceeding arrogant. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's any time anymore to be like Saul of Tarsus, breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Yeah. You know, Calling people Esau when the Esau's the Esau's are the one who, for one morsel, one little flip of pleasure, sold their birthright. Right. Okay, accusing anybody, accusing people of saying that uh, um, God gave up on you, God gave up on me. When the Book of Romans tells you, what did God give them up unto? Vile affections, vile sexual affections. Okay. Okay, a form of godliness denying the power from such turn away. Who are we turning away from? Who are, who are the ones we're turning away from? The sort that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led with divers lusts. Who are the ones ever learning and ever learning and never able? The ones that creep into houses and lead captive silly women, led with divers lusts, mm-hmm. and passing it off as the love of God. We had a man in Pembroke. He was a whoremonger who stood, stood as a spiritual authority, and he would have his meetings with women. And the women would come to his meetings, and then he'd single one out, and he'd do this over and over again. He'd groom every, every, as many of them as he could, constant, constant practice, bring them, and want to have sex with them. And when the woman would say, well, this isn't right, I'm not supposed to have sex with you. And he would say, well, you know, I'm in the stead of Jesus Christ. Okay? And he'd say, well, most of the time, when a Christian touches someone unclean, then they become unclean, but Jesus is clean, so you can be unclean, but when you touch Jesus with your uncleanness, you become clean. And I'm in the stead of Christ. So we can touch each other, and you'll be clean. And still again, other people say, well, you know, I'm in the stead of Christ, and and Christ, uh, uh, we're going to spiritualize the sexual act, and Christ goes in unto his bride, and gives them her, his seed, and she becomes pure. So therefore, I'm the man of God, and I have the love of God, and I can go into these women sexually, literally, physically, sexually, and somehow convince these women that that they become clean in this. Mm -hmm. And what an utter, total perversion 
and defilement of God's people and misuse of authority were going way, 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 way beyond some little sin of the flesh. Okay, but the parable of the... So, if, if a man is in such a state, if a man of authority is in such a state, should he be standing up, raging, and pronouncing curse against all the people who would not submit or consent to that kind of behavior? Yeah. No, brothers, we're in our integrity. Right. We're in our integrity. And we just wait on God. Their folly will be made manifest. In fact, already has been. And it's continuing to be so. I talked the other week about Malachi. I've spread dung on your faces, you Levites. Because you were, whatever he said in Malachi, they weren't walking right. So I spread dung on your face. Yeah, all the filthy dung of all the flesh things you did, I'm going to put it right on your face. Everyone's going to look at you, and they're going to see all that filth. When they look in your face, instead of seeing the honor that should go with ministers and everything, they're going to see all your dung. I put dung on your face. And again, the golden calf, Aaron made the people naked unto their enemies, to their shame. And, behold, I will curse your blessings. I've cursed them already. And you begin to see the diminishing of the influence, diminishing as, as it gets weaker and weaker, less and less, less people, less money, less outreach, less effect. And if you want to keep following that pattern, go ahead. I, you know, many weeks ago, you remember when I preached mm -hmm. in authority, the, the uh, prayer of Hannah, talk no more exceeding proudly. Don't let arrogancy come out of your mouth. It's not time to be arrogant. It's not time to breathe out threatening and slaughter. It's not time to try to hold your superiority in your authority when we are in this treacherous time, this time of total failure and falling and iniquity and depravity and apostasy and falling away from the greatest to the least. It's time to drop your status. If you want to be reconciled with your brother, it's time to drop the status and become a peacemaker. The peacemaker will drop its status. God dropped his, you got to drop yours. Unless you don't want to be reconciled. Unless, unless you, you decide that uh, we're not friends or whatever you want to do. That, that's up to you. But the onus is on the authority there with peacemaking and, peacema and also with charity. But peacemaking doesn't work without charity. You see? All right. So, so you go on with the unjust steward. To how much you owe? A hundred measures of wheat. Well, take thy bill and write four score. And look. The Lord commended the unjust steward. Well, at least the unjust steward finally got commended, right? He didn't get put out of his stewardship. Well, he walked in the threat that he was about to be for quite some time. He was scared he was. And at least he had enough fear of God to kind of lower the bar to everybody who was kind of holding this high, high bar to everybody. And so God commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And look, I'm spiritualizing this. I'm making this uh, a story, uh, a parable uh, that relates to the church. Because a lot of people relate this to the unrighteous man and they try to relate it to the world. But, but I'm spiritualizing it because it has all the spiritual elements in it. The steward. Mm -hmm. You know, the steward is not somebody in the world... The, the Lord's goods are the God's people. And he wasted his goods and Paul wasted the church. It all fits in. It's all a pattern here. He that, oh, and I say to you, make, your, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So let's spiritualize this too and make it make sense with the rest of the parable. Friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now we have mammon. We have riches. We have the riches of the understanding and knowledge and will of God. We have the riches of the Holy Ghost. The riches of mercy and grace and truth. Riches. But we have it in earthen vessels. We possess it in the unrighteousness of our flesh. So it's the mammon. It is mammon. But our, our, our flesh vessels of themselves are unrighteous. So we have this treasure, this mammon, this riches, an earthen vessel. 
in a weak earthen vessel that's constantly stumbling and fumbling and falling and trying and fighting and against sin and flesh and the devil. Okay. So make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Let's become friends. Let's all become friends so that when you fail, not if you fail, but when you fail. Another reason why don't get all bent out of shape when you see people fail, even authorities and all of that, because part of that is, is God's design. Part of it is still God's design. You see, in all of this we're saying, well, we're, we're talking in authority and we're being strong about a lot of issues. But in every one of the issues, King Manasseh, he went down to peace, he got reconciled to God. How about Saul the Apostle? Why, he turned around, he became the greatest of the apostles, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody loved the church more than Paul did. Yep. All right. And make to yourself friend the man on righteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So brothers, I would like to have a place in your heart. I would like you to make a habitation a place, a place in your heart for me. And I want, I want to be friends. So if I fail, you are built up and nursed in the words of truth and faith and the ministry of stewards of the mystery of God. You can minister to me the reconciliation, the grace, the mercy that I need, the things, and then, then I will have a place in your heart. Mm -hmm. You will receive me into everlasting habitations. I'll, you'll, I'll, you'll be, I'll be in your heart everlasting for all eternity. Now you can't apply the scripture like that to the heathen. And that's why I'm saying we're spiritualizing this scripture and applying it in a way that's for the church. Okay. He that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. He that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Hmm. If you haven't been faithful in the gifts and calling that I gave you in the vessel of sinful flesh and everything else, then why should I give you the eternal everlasting riches? You've got to be faithful. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found. No one can serve from masters. They'll hate the one and love the other, or else they'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. All right. Now, I'm going to finish it off with a description of the characteristics of peacemakers. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the Bible says, when Jesus was set, his disciples come to him. And that's a little statement that represents how when Jesus was resurrected and set at the right hand of God, then God draws the church to him. You know, I, I'll, actually, I'll draw all men unto, unto me. And when his disciples, when he was set, his disciples came unto them, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor, and so on, and blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Like I said, the children is a son. The son can't do anything but what he sees the father do. Did you see God drop his status to make peace? Did you see it? Did you see God as the one with the possessor of charity make the first move? God did not put some onus of charity on us. While you were yet sinners, Christ died. There's no onus of charity on you. Never, 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 never should authority put the onus of charity on the weaker vessel to accommodate his pleasure. Never should you do that. Amen. Listen, blessed are the peacemakers. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Can we do that? It says we can. You have to be wise as a serpent and then you can be harmless as a dove. Now, we don't want to minister to rebellion. We don't want to provoke authority. Nope. And both things are happening. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-way street here. Both things are happening. 
perilous, treacherous times. How are you ever going to get the righteousness of God and reconciliation of God's people out of this? It's like, it's like the Mexican standoff. I'm the authority. Yeah, but you're from Earth. I'm the authority and you have to do this. You know, we could stand off like that forever. May God help and make some kind of move. But I am expounding what the necessity is upon authority to instigate the peacemaking and reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. If the authorities are not willing to do it, then there will be no reconciliation. There will be none. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of woods, wolves, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So I want to break down the three words. Wise means very discreet, implying a cautious character, very wise, very cautious, you know, not flippant. You know, one may say the righteous are bold as a lion, but if we're, we're not wise and we're foolish, a fool rages and is confident. And that's the counterfeit of the righteous are bold as a lion. So what spirit are we of? Call down fire from heaven, you're damned. What, a, what, what, what spirit are you of? You know, if, if I'm such a wayward person, and a, a man of authority is right, and I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm the subordinate, then the man of authority might be David, and I might be like Absalom, the son of David. And you know, Absalom was, tried to usurp the kingdom from David and everything else. And Absalom was a pretty wrong guy to David, his father, and a lot of the things he did. And so, what was, David's, uh, what was David's response when Absalom was killed? Was it was that good riddance? I'm glad they're gone. Was that his attitude? Well, yeah. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom. Oh, my God, I would die for you, Absalom. That's a heart of charity. Well, if you have some kind of other response... You Ichabod, you Esau, you damn. That's that's your response. Where is your charity? If, if if you have a heart of David, what it means is you don't believe then that that brother is a brother. Yeah, he would mourn. He would mourn. All right, so. A sheep in the midst of wolves, wise as serpents. Wise is a cautious character. Remember we preached weeks back on, there was a, a, a little city and a few men in it, and it was besieged by an enemy and built great bulwarks against it. And within that city was a poor wise man, and the poor wise man by his wisdom, he delivered the city. No, not by a bunch of whatever, raging and antics. No, he, by his wisdom he delivered the city. Yet nobody remembered the poor wise man. So, wisdom. Wisdom is discreet. It's subtle sometimes. It's cautious. It tries to do things as carefully as it can. You know, and uh, we were talking about charity earlier, right? I think it's Carl. Love is not easily provoked, but sometimes it is, but not easily provoked. And wisdom is like that. Wisdom is not easily provoked to do something out of rage, and something rash. Because remember, rage is a blinding emotion. You do things without thought of the consequences. It temporarily blinds you. So, if we're peacemakers, then we're wise. And we're wise as serpents. The uh, word serpent is, implies, it, it, it does talk about serpents, and you know, the devil is a serpent, but what about the serpent? Is, is Satan a dummy? No, he's a lot wiser. He's more subtle than any beast. Of Very subtle. Yeah. And he sees a whole lot of stuff that you don't. And he's in the background calculating how he can influence the situation to bring something to pass. Well, let's be the same way with being peacemakers. Yeah. It all has to do with studying, being careful, being discreet, thinking about the timing, taking forethought. And we want to be harmless as doves. We, want, we don't want to uh, aggravate, exasperate the situation any more than we have to, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's that. So there's, 
uh, wise, which is discretion and mental awareness, consciousness of knowledge, and uh, there is serpent. The serpent has a sharp vision. Snakes have a very sharp vision, and they're very cunning, mm -hmm. and they're very artful, and very, you know, that's the, the, the serpent. And then harmless as doves. Now the word harmless, akieros, I mean, I'm not that interested in pronouncing the Greek equivalents, but I'm, I'm taking the Greek definitions here, all right? Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. What's harmless? Harmless is innocent, harmless, and simple. Harmless as a dove. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, lighting on him like a dove. Dove is the symbol of peace. Yes. The wisdom that's from a from is pure, first, 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 pure, then peaceable. peaceable. Follow peace and holiness with all men. If much is life in you, if it's possible, live, be at peace. Now, it's not always possible. Sometimes love is provoked. Sometimes authority is provoked and they will rebuke and they're right to do so. Sometimes saints are rebuked, they're bullied, and they'll be compelled to blasphemy. And the authority had a good hand to play in compelling and provoking it. Mm -hmm. we got all this back and forth going on. But the dove is looking to be peaceable and harmless, not injurious. Now, you're not always going to be injurious, but I'm, I am invoking these characteristics for the purpose of reconciliation, making reconciliation and peace. If you're going to institute or instigate a, whatever, a motion of reconciliation, and we have received the ministry of reconciliation, then you're, this is what's going to have to happen. There's going to have to be some kind of peaceableness somewhere in the process. All right, so a dove, any of various widely distributed birds of the family Columbidae, which includes the pigeons having a small head. <laughs> you want to play on words there, not big-headed, not conceited. The doves have a small head, humble. You don't think a whole lot of yourself. Small head and characteristic cooing call. A gentle, innocent person. A person who advocates Peace, a person who advocates reconciliation, a person who advocates negotiating this peace and reconciliation in preference to having a confrontation. Yeah. Or an armed conflict. Mm -hmm. It means they're subtle, they're wise, they're looking not to be injurious because they know how volatile it is and treacherous on both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. So therefore they are deliberately coming with the pre- predisposed mindset. I'm going to try to avoid confrontation and armed conflict. But not the fool, though. The fool will just rage and demonstrate his confidence. Well, seek peace and pursue it. Here's the criteria. Last hour, hour and a half or whatever. It's all about peacemakers. There's criteria for authority in order to make reconciliation and peace, without which there will be no reconciliation. Not my words. Not my counsel. I'm simply stating the necessities of the law of God. Receive it or don't receive it. It's up to you. I've laid it out as I have received it. Okay? That's about it. I'm done. <laughs>